Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, little gray day here in Baltimore. Um, my name is Jamie Seward, and I'm Senior Associate Director of Alumni Relations at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, before we start the program, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins Medicine Department of Neurology and Brain Sciences. They're always wonderful partners, and we're so happy to have them here today. I also want to encourage all of you to ask questions by typing them in the Zoom Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. And now I have the pleasure of turning the program over to my wonderful colleague, Rachel Erber. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Early. Dr. Early is a professor of neurology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He also serves as director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Restless Leg Syndrome, a certified RLS quality care center. Dr. Early is board certified in internal medicine, neurology, and sleep medicine. His research and clinical interests are devoted to sleep medicine with a special interest in RLS. Specifically, Dr. Early is focused on understanding the pathophysiology of RLS and further elucidating the value of various treatments. He is chair of the Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation's Combined Scientific and Medical Advisory Board and an active member of the Research Grant Committee. And without further ado, I will pass it along to Dr. Early. Uh, good afternoon. Let me sort of set up the share here and make sure we can get connected. Hopefully everyone can see my slide. We can. It looks great. Good. Okay. So I will assume that those on this presentation already know something about Russ's leg syndrome. So I'm not going to go into the, some of the general clinical stuff. I'm going to dive right into the issue of augmentation, which remains one of the unfortunate common complications of uh, treatment with dopamine agonists. Uh, the only thing I have to declare is I have a um, research support um, from American Region, which is uh, uh, use of uh, IV iron in, in one of the clinical trials. So, um, I came to Hopkins in 1991, at which time my colleague, Richard Allen, had been treating patients with restless leg syndrome with carbidopa levodopa for the last two to three years. And at that point in time, what I discovered or started to see is this sort of progressive worsening of symptoms in patients whose symptoms had been relatively stable, though untreated and quite severe, had been stable for literally decades. And though the initial treatment proved to be highly effective for managing the symptoms, what we were starting to see is that they, their symptoms were really profoundly worse. They were growing in terms of intensity, duration, and we kept increasing the drug more and more and more until we realized what the problems was. And we published that data in 1996, though we presented the original data at the Sleep Society meeting in 1994, essentially demonstrating that this drug, though highly effective in managing symptoms, unfortunately produces a significant worsening or augmentation of the symptoms. In that publication, we outlined the basic criteria for augmentation, clinical criteria. Essentially, the commonest one is earlier onset of symptoms, so the patients may present with bedtime symptoms, they get on treatment, they're doing fine for several years, and suddenly they start reporting having symptoms earlier in the evening. The general response to that has been and was and shouldn't be, but it is adding another medication earlier in the evening to cover the evening dose, and the patient goes away happy for another six months, another year, until they return with symptoms in the afternoon. And then you can after, put on an afternoon dose and things go fine for six months until they come back with symptoms in the morning and then ad infinitum. And so early onset of symptoms is the commonest presentation. Increasing intensity of the symptoms, this often, so this often to, often, the often uh, difficult to describe sensations that patients with Russell Lake syndrome have, basically that intensity, that symptom intensity starts to increase. Um, and it may 
reach a level where the sensation before was very uncomfortable, but not painful, it now may become actually painful. Where before patients might report having twisting or movements in their muscles, the muscles may now go into full outright spasms. Tolerance to the medications, and that's sort of the medication that was put on originally to cover, for example, bedtime symptoms. It is no longer working. Now the, the symptoms are breaking through in at sleep onset or during the period of sleep. And thus the medication that was originally started at a given dose, it is, it is no longer working anymore. So classic tolerance and medication. And then finally, greater body distribution for everyone with restless leg syndrome, obviously the symptoms are in your legs. It may be part of the leg, maybe the whole leg, but over time, as the symptoms augment, the symptoms may go up to other body parts, usually shoulders or wrists is the first. Sometimes it may involve the whole arms and then move to the central part of your trunk. And in some patients, it involves the whole body, even up to the neck and into their face, that, that indicating a, a increasing degree of severity uh, or augmentation of the symptoms. But from a clinical point of view, from a basic you know, conceptualization point of view. You can forget all those four points. If you are on a dopamine agonist and you as a physician or you as a patient feel that the symptoms are getting worse, just generally statement, are the symptoms getting worse? You got to consider augmentation um, if you're on a dopamine agonist. Are there alternative reasons why the symptoms may get worse? And the answer is yes. And so as a physician treating RLS patients, there's things you need to look at if a patient's symptoms are worsening and they're on their doping agonist. Could it be something else? So iron deficiency would be a, a not an uncommon cause of worsening RLS symptoms. In the rare situations, renal dysfunction may occur. And obviously during pregnancy uh, in women, the symptoms may worsen. Anything that affects the quality or quantity of your sleep will significantly impact your restless leg symptoms. I think anyone with restless legs knows that they've lost sleep at night, the RLS is gonna be bad the following night. And that's true in a general sense. If you're relatively stable in your medications and your symptoms have gotten worse, have you developed some sleep-related issues? Sleep apnea, for example, more importantly, which COVID has brought out, is that people ended up with an irregular sleep break schedule. They're living, working, breathing inside their house, a lot of stress, and they're losing sleep over it. And with that sleep loss, the RLS has gotten worse. I have people who change jobs who are getting up at seven in the morning to get to work locally, now have a job change, have to go down to DC, and are basically getting up at five in the morning. Obviously, that's going to impact the quality of sleep getting up at five in the morning since they are not five in the morning people. Those small nuance changes in sleep will have a major impact on the RLS symptoms. Is the patient on any new offending agents? Antihistamines, antidepressants, any antidopaminergics? The um, a often missed antidopaminergic is metoclopramide or also brand name Reglan, which is sometimes used in people with severe reflux. Um, so there are those agents, obviously the standard antidepressants everyone knows about. Uh, you just need to be aware if you go on these medications and the symptoms start to worsen that those medications could be the cause for it. And then any pain related conditions, specifically back pain, back pain with sciatica, knee pain. Knee pain, for whatever reason, more so than hip or ankle pain, is an important aggravant of RLS symptoms. And then nerve damage, specifically what's called small fiber neuropathy, seems to be more likely to lower the threshold for RLS symptoms. So those are the elements that any physician should be looking at to determine whether or not the worsening of the symptoms are due to something other than the dopamine agonist. If these these alternative or covariant factors are not there, then the likelihood it's related to the drug. And so in our database analysis, looking over a 10 year period, we looked at um, the survival of patients on these various different medications. 
So at about 12 months, approximately 12 percent of pa 12 percent of patients had stopped one of these agents as a response to the, the upfront side effects. With dopamine agonists, it's nasal congestion, uh, it's fluid retention, it's nausea, vomiting. And so a lot of people, about 12 percent of people who go on the dopamine agonists will have side effects. After that six month period, the dropout rate from using Requip, Pergolide, or the Mirapex was all related to augmentation. And so you can see the quote augmentation rates are quite high among those who are on Requip versus Pergolide versus Mirapex. The Pergolide is a is an old dopamine agonist which is uh, no longer on the market. The common the two that are currently used are Requip and Mirapex. The roticotine and roticotine patch, which is a dopamine agonist, was not available during the, the, um, uh, the time that this data analysis was done. So you can see that augmentation is a common factor and almost linear in its progression over time, um, and, and, and basically at rates of you know five to eight, seven to eight percent per year in requip versus four percent per year in in the uh, Mirapex primary primary patch group, and so. The dopamine hypothesis of Russell's Lake syndrome was proposed by Akpinar in 1987. He is credited with providing the first substantial data that carbidopa levodopa uh, actually dramatically improves symptoms. He had originally published the data as a little abstract in 81, and then as a letter, um, a letter to the editor in 82, and then the formal randomized crossover trial was published in 1987, and it was this paper that influenced all subsequent use of the dopamine agents in, in Russell's Lake syndrome. And he proposed that because L-dope is so highly effective in, in improving symptoms and the dopamine antagonists, those drugs that block the dopamine receptors can worsen symptoms, there must be a dopamine factor. Second, he recognized, as has been true, that iron deficiency is a major leading cause or precipitant of RLS symptoms. And based upon the role of iron, iron is an essential factor in dopamine metabolism. So putting those two together, he proposed that there might be something wrong with dopamine production. So what I'm going to do is go through a series of data that we have, our group in large part, but others have generated in the last 25 years to try to understand the dopaminergic system in restless leg syndrome from which is derived a concept of augmentation. And so I'm going to start with simple um, model. And so as you all should know that, you know, your brain is made up of neurons or nervous cells that connect to each other. And so when we're talking about the dopamine system, we're talking about a, an area of the brain, the back of the brain, a group of those cells are in an area called the substantia nigra. That, that cell, in this case, the blue cell, produces a chemical called dopamine. This is where the dopamine's made, and it sends it forward up into the deeper parts of the brain. And that basically part of the brain is called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is like a connection center where you get all this information coming in, and it the basic ganglia makes decisions about movement. It makes decisions if there's a reward, if there's pain, if there's a need to move. Basically, it makes the final decisions about moving the arm and moving the leg. And so basically, this is the center. The substantia nigra to the basal ganglia is one of the major centers by which we are able to walk, move, do things in a positive manner. But essentially, as in, in this scenario, this area of the brain is the area that's been damaged and missing in Parkinson's disease. This, in pathology, there's absolutely no indication that there's any damage to the cells in this part of the brain, nor in this part of the brain. What we believe is just it, there's a metabolic rearrangement of this relationship that exists in RLS. It's not a loss. It's just a new modification of, of the underlying function. What you need to know is that the output, so you make the dopamine here, it goes down, it sits at this, this spot here and gets released into this space that will trigger a signal which comes along the second neuron 
And that information often feeds back. Everything in the brain is about feedback. It's always integrating and telling itself what you've done. And this feeds back and tells this part of the cell, you can slow down, you can increase. So this is the dynamics that's involved in the dopamine system that is, it, that is affected by in RLS patients. So the dopamine hypothesis of Russell's leg syndrome. And what is believed or originally proposed, is it possible that there's a decreased synthesis of dopamine? That, that this is secondary to a decrease in the functioning of tyrosine hydroxylase, which makes the dopamine. And that this tyrosine hydroxylase is secondarily influenced by low iron in the brain. And so that was a proposal that sort of was a, the existing concept back in 1990, uh, when we started this process of trying to understand the system. So the data that we have, originally from autopsy data, is that what you see in this area of the brain, the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia, the, the slide you have here shows that tyrosine hydroxylase, in this picture, it's called phosphorylate, the PTH, or the phosphorylate tyrosine hydroxylase over the total. What you see, patients with RLS actually have increased the amount of the enzyme versus control. And this is, this is true for both the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia. So it's not a decrease, it's an absolute increase. If you look at cerebral spinal fluid, the, you can look at metabolites of dopamine and that finding in cerebral spinal fluid also supports the concept that there's an actual increase in dopamine synthesis in, in brains of RLS patients. Another way to look at this, given the idea that there's some changes in the dopamine system that might in part be related to decreases of iron in the brain, we looked at the what's called the brain iron deficiency rat model. You can make rats iron deficient to the point where the brain iron levels are decreased. And originally we thought, well, the findings in RLS can't be about iron, right? I mean, iron should be decreasing tyrosine hydroxylase and should be decreasing dopamine. So we went to the animal model, produced brain iron deficiency and found just the opposite. What we found was it, it also shows that iron deficiency increases tyrosine hydroxylase activity in both the substantia nigra in the basic basal ganglia, just like in RLS patients. It, it, again, allowing us to continue to pursue the idea that iron deficiency is an important part of pathology, but not, not, not directly acting on the tyrosine hydroxide, but probably acting in some different manner to increase this, this level of enzyme. So another approach is in the hypothesis is, well, maybe it's not related to decreased synthesis. As I said, dopamine's made up in the, this blue, this cell body, it's set forward into the brain, into the basal ganglia, and dopamine can be released. It goes across and stimulates the, the neuron right next door to, on some receptors. But nature has provided a way to make sure the amount of dopamine in that space or synapse is not excessive. You can it can be immediately taken back up into the cell by a special transporter. It, it can alter release so it doesn't release as much or there's enzymes in that space that can digest it up. So there's multiple different ways for nature to control how much dopamine is actually in that space irrespective of how much is made in the cell, how much is in that space. And so there was a proposal that there was a decrease in, in release, or possibly there's a, a, a increase in the transport, so the dopamine's taken right back up again. The resultant being there's little, there's less amount in that space to stimulate the opposing cell. So in looking at that, we, we use a device called PET, which is positron, positron emission tomography. Basically, you take a chemical which will bind to the various trans transporters or to the receptors that has a radioactive tag on it. You give it intravenously, you wait about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then you start scanning the brain and you can see the human brain and see where these are taken up. This is a picture uh, of the basal ganglia 
in this yellow orange color. And the intensity, the red intensity is an indication of the amount of tracer or amount of the transport of the dopamine uptake transporter. And you can see in RLS, it's substantially less than in controls. And so this study suggests that this transporter is not increased, but in fact, it's actually decreased. You can also do similar type of PET looking at the amount, assessing the amount of dopamine that's actually in that space, that, that, that how much is actually being released or not taken back up. And basically the PET scans, again, further suggest that there's an increased amount of dopamine in that space. Then finally, cerebral spinal fluid, again, supports the concept that there is increased dopamine in that space, in that synapse. Again, we can go to the RAT model as a way to explore this in more detail, see if there's compatibility with the concept of brain iron deficiency playing a role in this. And again, the brain iron deficiency model mimics almost identically the findings in the human situation. So iron deficiency in the brain produces this increased release and a decrease in the amount of that transporter. The end result is you have an, over, an overall increase in active dopamine in that, in that synapse, thus available to stimulate the opposing cell, to stimulate the receptor. So a third hypothesis as to why the, that RLS responds to the dopamine agonist appears to have a decreased dopamine function is the concept that though you may be making enough dopamine and you may be releasing enough dopamine that the, the secondary cell, this green cell that you see here, that the receptors on that cell are altered. So you can make all the dopamine in the world it's gonna be less sensitive to it. And therefore the final signal is not gonna be as impactful as if the receptors were increased or amplified. And so the concept here is that maybe there's a decrease in the quantity or quality of those dopamine receptors. And what you see in autopsy tissues is in fact a decrease in the receptors. So, the dopamine receptors, there's five different dopamine receptors, dopamine one, two, three, four, and five. The receptors that are looked at tend to be those with what's called the dopamine two receptors or dopamine three receptors. They're very similar. Um, that's primarily because that's where the research has been for Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, I wish there was a lot of um, um, or less specific type of research, but most of the research that is done, most of the ligands that are developed have been developed as a way to measure these various different factors in Parkinson's disease. So it's somewhat selective in, in the ligands and whatever that had been developed over these last number of decades. So in autopsy material, there is a decrease in the receptor number. More importantly, pre-mortem, before death, RLS patients would fill out the international R severity scale. So you have a severity scale, a symptom severity. And what you found is there's a negative correlation between the receptor number, amount, and severity. So the lower the receptor, the more severe the symptoms are. So you have a relative decrease and then a strong correlation between the amount of receptor that you have and your, your severity. Again, PET scan studies allowed us to look at the receptors and they also support the concept that in the living human individual with RLS, that there is a decrease in the number of D2 receptors in the base of ganglia relative controls. And then finally, our RAT model, again, demonstrating the relevance of the brain iron deficiency as part of the pathology of RLS. Again, identify identical problems with the receptor, but more importantly, what the RAT model allows you to do is look more at the complexity of it. It's not a simple up or down. I wish it were that simple. It's not about having, you know, you know, X amount of receptors or you know less. It's about the quality of those receptors. How good is the how, how good is the signal? How are they interacting? So it's a very very complex environment, which the again the brain iron deficiency model allows us to look and explore in much more detail than we can in the actual human situation. So let's look at a summary of this and hopefully you're all on board. So I just summarize this to give you a quick perspective of what we just talked about. So as I said, 
that cell body in the substantia nigra is where the dopamine is synthesized. Okay. At the end of this, in this basal ganglia area where the cell finally gets there, it, the area is called the synapse. That's the space where the dopamine is released. There appears to be an increased release and a decreased uptake. So giving you a relative increase in the total amount of available dopamine to stimulate the receptor. So what you end up having is a relative hyper-dopaminergic presynaptic state. So this system is hyper-dopaminergic. In Parkinson's disease, as I told you, this is missing. So in Parkinson's disease, this is hypo decreased dopaminergic. So that's a, a biological construct which clearly distinguishes this condition and all subsequent use of medications from that of Parkinson's disease. What appears to be relevant to the changes in the dopamine system that seem to decrease the dopamine signal is happening in the postsynaptic part. So these receptors, there seems to be an alterations in the number of receptors, the type of receptors, and their interaction with, with, with covariant receptors. And that seems to be producing a relative hypodopinergic state. So in one situation, so you have a dynamic process here, as I say, you have a system that's in part hypo, hyperactive and the other is hypoactive. But in the end, the final, no matter how much you make, how much you release, in the end, the final signal is gonna come there. So how does that play into the concepts of augmentation? So if we look at what's relative to normal, and going back to what I just showed you, what you seem to have is an increase in synthesis, an increased release of dopamine, uh, indicating this is a hyperdopaminergic state, but the opposing cell on those receptors appear to be desensitized, and therefore the subsequent signal is markedly diminished, giving you RLS symptoms. If I add a drug, which remember all the drugs, the carbidopa levodopa works by actually converting to dopamine. So that physically increases the total amount of dopamine in your brain. Things like rapinerol or primipexil are, are designed to mimic dopamine in your brain. They specifically bind to the receptor. And so if I give you that drug, I'm going to increase the amount of, of stimulation that's occurring in the opposing cell on these receptors. And therefore, you have a relative increase in the signal. And because I have increase in dopamine, I decrease your symptoms great, everything's fine, everything's working great, and so we have a problem. Remember the original model I showed you, that you have information, the dopamine synthesis in the substantia nigra going to the base of the ganglia, and then you have the release, and that there's a feedback mechanism. And so what is happening is, as you add this drug at some point in time, is gonna cause these receptors to desensitize even further. And then there's gonna be a feedback to the substantia nigra. And now you're gonna start not only reducing the receptors, now you're gonna start reducing the production of dopamine before it was high. Now it's gonna be decreased. The amount of dopamine that's actually available will also be decreased. So now you have a double whammy. You have the presynaptic part, which was hyper, is now becoming hypo. And then you have the receptors on the opposing cell, which are also decreasing. And therefore, what you end up, the dopamine signal is going even further down. And therefore, your symptoms are going even further up. So why stop there? Why don't we just add more drug? And of course, we can add more drug. And for the in the short run, it's going to overstimulate the receptors that are there. But again, it's going to feed back and reduce the production of dopamine even further. So the amount of dopamine actually available here starts to decrease. These receptors become even less sensitive to your drug and your signal just drops even more precipitously and your symptoms, as you know, for those who have been augmented, just, just go sky high. Now, that seems like a, that is a fairly simple construct of dopamine system in RLS and augmentation. Um, it is 
a little more dynamic in that because what we all know is that RLS symptoms have a distinctive circadian pattern. That is, they start out as a problem that's at night or at sleep onset or during sleep. And over time, they tend to get worse, but coming on earlier in the day. Uh, so how does that construct, how do we, how do we negotiate that construct within the framework of the dopamine system? And so what we know is that the dopamine system, and we're not talking specifically about the production or the receptor, we're talking about the final output, that final output that could be changes in the receptor, that could be changes in production, some dynamic change that is eventually going to change the signal, okay? We know that that signal oscillates. So we know around four or five o'clock in the morning, your dopamine levels will go up just in concert with your, your level of arousal. So the dopamine system is just following your arousal mechanism. So your dopamine levels go up and are at the highest in the morning, which is often as many RLS patients know, your protective period. It's when you can, you can lie down still or take a long ride because your dopamine levels at that, at that time are probably at their highest. As the day goes on, those levels come down to reach a nadir, which is relatively low. And at that point in time, the potential for RLS to develop. What we believe happens in RLS is that that dopaminergic system, the overall function gets shifted downwards. Um, whether that's a change in receptors or production, we can all debate that, but the overall eventual signal seems to shift downwards. And what you what you have is you still have plenty of high, uh, the levels of dopamine are, are, are high during the day. So it's not going to be a problem. It doesn't become a problem until this nadir, because what happens is this nadir in RLS shifts downwards enough below normal that you start getting symptoms. So the amount of dopamine that you need to make, the amount that you're making becomes inadequate. So you start having symptoms. And those symptoms are going to be restricted to late evening, bedtime, or sometime around sleep. And that may oscillate initially. And some people, it might be once a week, once a month, but eventually it, it, this system becomes uh, more or less standard. And so you start having symptoms every night. If I add a drug on, I can improve these symptoms. But over time, as the previous model showed, your natural production and your eventual dopamine output is going to decrease. And that's going to overall start to decrease. So this curve starts sliding downwards. So your symptoms start coming on earlier. The amount of medication that you initially took to cover the initial symptoms is no longer working. Now you have tolerance. Symptoms are breaking through. If you add more dopamine drug, you can cover this difference. But over time, this will shift further and further and further to the point that this whole dopamine cascade falls below the threshold. And now you have symptoms 24 seven, they're breaking through the worst than you can possibly believe. And if you ever miss the dose, you will now realize that you are now physically dependent on that drug because your natural dopamine system has been suppressed so much um, you're, you're basically uh, or being forced to be on that drug in order to, to continue to have any sense of relief. So what are the treatment options? If the patient has clinically stable, if patient's been clinically stable on dopamine agonist for at least three months, then has a worsening of, of, of our loss, obviously consider augmentation. And we've gone through the alternative choices in deciding about whether it's augmentation or not. Making a single increase in dose is always temporizing. Um, you know, some of my colleagues do. I, I am, I, I do not, but I think a single increase is is within the spectrum of clinically possible. Just, it's likely to be temporizing. So you might buy a year, you might buy two years, or you might only buy three months of time. The important thing is never, never more than. The, never once, never more than once, and never exceed the maximum dose of the medications. And I'll, I'll go over that. So there's dose levels, which are identified by the FDA as maximal for restless leg syndrome. The problem is many people treating restless leg syndrome who have also treated Parkinson's disease don't understand the difference between doses for RLS and doses for Parkinson's disease, which are 10 times that for restless leg syndrome. 
recommend a maximal doses. So you should never go beyond 0.5 of the primary paxil, two milligrams of the recrip, or three milligrams of the reticotine patch. Maintain the current. So the all, all option is to maintain the current dose. If you consider augmentation and add an alternative uh, agent from a different class, either uh, alpha two delta agent like gabapentin or, or, or an opioid. And then education. For me, educating my patients about the what augmentation means, um, why I'm doing what I'm doing, what is the next plan? Okay, we have a plan. What's plan B when things don't? Those things I think are very, very important. So when the patient returns and the symptoms are worse after doing a change or scheduling, um, you're both on the same page as to what needs to happen next. Augmentation will unfortunately happen to everyone on a dopamine agonist. It's just a matter of time and dose. Um, as you can see in, uh, in the previous, there are certain uh, medications that are, but have a much slower augmentation rate versus others. But in the end, everyone reaches, everyone gets some level of augmentation eventually. So drug withdrawal. So, so what I tend to do mostly is get patients off the drugs because by the time people come to see me, all the manipulations that I just addressed above have taken place plus more, unfortunately. And so the concept is simple. Um, it's about restoring your natural dopamine. If the drug over time has suppressed your natural production of dopamine, then, slow, then reducing the drug itself should hopefully allow your brain levels to go back to something. So the immediate consequence of drug withdrawal is the immediate worsening of symptoms, right? If you, as you know, if you miss that drug, if I try to cut it back a little, your symptoms are going to get worse. Your restless leg symptoms and your dopamine levels are one and the same. They are intimately related. I flip up your dopamine, your RLS goes down. I flip down your dopamine, your RLS gets worse. So if I reduce your drug dose at any level, the RLS is going to get worse. That's the immediate effect. The long-term effect, the long-term consequences, and the real purpose of the whole drug detoxification process is in the long-term, there will be a restoration of your natural dopamine control and improvement towards pre-treatment symptom levels. But the difference between the immediate consequences and long-term consequences is, is the point of, of, of difficulty. Medication that attenuates the withdrawal symptoms prevents the biological reversal of augmentation. And this is controversial. I, I can tell you there are RLS experts out there who will pretreat people to attenuate or block the symptom withdrawal. I, I am going from what I believe is the biology of this disease and indicating that if I prevent the withdrawal of symptoms, I am basically preventing the underlying biological reversal of what has come as a consequence of the chronic use of the dopamine agents. So there's a tapering period, which is based upon how much the patient is on. And then there's a drug-free period for me, this is my protocol of 12 nights without any RLS medications. So my approach is I re every three days at a minimum, you can extend that. I reduce the dose of medication um, if the patient's on Rapinerol, I change them over to Premipaxel at a six to one conversion. So if they're on six milligrams of Rapinerol, I'll put them on one milligram of uh, Premipaxel. There are some nuanced pharmacological, pharmacological difference between Premipaxel and Rapinerol, which makes, which does in part help attenuate some of the, of the withdrawal symptoms. And I think people coming off the Premipaxel have a, a lot easier time coming off the Premipaxel than actual straight off the Recrib. If they're on primary paxil, then putting them on the reticotine patch with that conversion may also help the process and so on. In general, I reduce my I reduce the dose of primary paxil by 0.25 milligrams per every three days, um, 0.5 of the of the repinerol or one milligram of the reticotine. That's my my general approach. So I want to talk about the drug free period. Um, so the for those who have gone through it, I, I don't need to tell you how bad it is for those who, who are on this presentation who have plans to do it. The first four days are severe and absolutely unimaginable with the exacerbation, there are less symptoms, basically nonstop symptoms for almost 48 hours, um, no sleep for probably close to three days, um, basically walking, walking, and obviously walking, 
will stop the symptoms, but you can't stop. And obviously you can't lie down and sleep. Um, and basically avoiding uh, driving, things like that during these four, first four days is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. Um, again, I think you're at, because of the sleep deprivation, you're at risk of driving. If you're going to work operating heavy machine, you should be doing that. So, um, operationally speaking, getting these four days off if you're going through this process is important. The second four days, day five to, to eight, um, there is actually an improvement in the level of alertness, even though the degree of sleep is is not that much improved. The symptoms are basically contracting back to something that's closer to the afternoon or evening and usually have, if it was up in the shoulders, maybe coming down more into the legs. Um, the last four days um, between day nine and day 12, you have about four to six hours of sleep. Some of it, most of it's fragmented. The RLS intensity has been much reduced. The symptoms have usually abated back to something that's close to late evening bedtime or, or during sleep. That means you've been allowed to have some freedom to nap or whatever in the morning or in the afternoon, and or at least at least being able to have a life that's not completely um, uh, occupied by the RLS symptoms 24 seven. And then I usually see patients back on, on day 13 of that drug-free period. Um, all of this information has been laid out in, in very, very good tale, in detail. Uh, if you go to rls.org, which is the RLS Foundation website, there is a brochure called Medication Withdrawal After Augmentation, which lays out all the items I've just mentioned to you. Now I want to go through some cases as an example of what I've done, what has been done, what can be done in terms of, of dealing with the augmentation issue. So this is a 56-year-old gentleman. Uh, symptoms started when he was 29, uh, originally just occurring at bedtime prior to starting treatment. Um, was on treatment for 15 years, originally clonazepam and then ropinirole. He was currently on ropinirole for 12 years. His dosing was three, three, and four milligrams. That is three in the morning, three in the afternoon, and four in the evening. So a total of 10 milligrams of ropinirole. His symptoms are essentially throughout the let throughout the day. They were arms, leg. He was a total body akathisia, completely. Uh, his sleep was fully fragmented. He was lucky to get two or three hours of sleep a night. None of it was, you know, none of it was more than an hour at any one time. He had other complications from these high doses, which is a narcolepsy-like condition, falling asleep at inappropriate times on the phone at work. He actually had two motor vehicle accidents. He had no compulsive behavior, which again is another common side effect uh, from high doses of the dopamine agonist, which he did not have. So I substituted the primary Paxil, as I mentioned, in, in an appropriate dose regimen. Uh, he had an afternoon dose and an evening dose. And then I did my standard reduction over three days, um, which took a while, obviously, because he was on such a high dose. Uh, he, he, he went through the 12-night drug-free period and, and came back to me after on day 13. So at that point in time, he had five or six hours of fragmented sleep. Symptoms at that primary at that time were primarily when he lies down at night, which remarkably, despite being on this drug for 12 years, is really back to where he was prior to even starting this medication. Um, he was having no problems during the day, no problems in the evening. For that, he was very happy. Um, again, the intensity was, was much, much less. Um, the narcolepsy symptoms completely resolved, and they often resolve the compulsive behavior, the narcolepsy-like behavior from the drugs were usually resolved by day five, so they're pretty quick to resolve. Um, he, he decided to stay off the medications, and that's one of the options. Everyone has to decide what they want to do, but he was so fed up with this medication, he really did not want to go back on. He wanted to see how things went out over the next couple of weeks, and, and again, being off the medication for 12 nights is, 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 is just a goal that I put out there that I think is achievable. If I told you you had to be off the drug for, two, for a month, you're not going to do this. So I chose a time, which is 12 nights off medication, as something that is reasonable, get you off the drug, get your system working again, and seem to be something that is a light at the end of the tunnel. When you're suffering on day two and three, you want to know you only have nine days left or eight days left. But it is true to say that many people will continue to go on and have improvements. This drug is likely to produce 
problems with their dopamine systems months and months after you get off the drug. And that's an issue. But, so on, 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 day, on week 12 of the post withdrawal symptom, I saw him back, he had mild symptoms now, only four days a week. Um, they're a primary at night. he get up, do some stretching and do some exercise and decided not to go back on further medication. I followed him up a year later and he, that's essentially where he was at that point in time, three to four nights per week, either at sleep on site or an hour after he got to sleep, he might get some RLS, but was happy that his life was back. He could live with that and decided not to return to any medication. So this second case is a 45 year old woman started um, when she was 29 during her pregnancy, was occasionally in the evening, mostly at bedtime prior to starting treatment. She was on Rapinerol for about four years and was just on three milligrams. Um, her symptoms were starting around 3 p.m. involving her legs and her shoulders. So all, uh, demonstrating the classic earlier onset of symptoms. Um, she had a moderate insomnia um, and she was getting about a, a total of six hours of sleep. So there was some tolerance to the medication. So the me medication wasn't quite giving her the full amount of sleep that she was getting before. The ferritin levels were uh, 25 micrograms per liter, which for those who don't know, is indicates she has at least a mild iron deficiency. Uh, her hemoglobin is 12.0. So she was not officially anemic. Less than 12 is a formally anemic, but her hemoglobin was low to begin with. So. So based upon our, the criteria of using IV iron in patients, um, uh, she received a iron dextran, low molecular weight, 1,000 milligrams uh, during her tapering period. Um, and in her situation, I just substituted the primary Paxil for the requip, did the usual reduction as I outlined previously. She returned to see me after, you know, um, after 12 nights off the medications. She, the drug-free period, appeared to be not as severe as expected. Again, um, the uh, iron therapy may have attenuated some of the symptom withdrawals, which I do see in some of my patients. Um, um, she was sleeping six to seven hours by day three, so it wasn't as bad as I predicted, which is fine. I mean, if, it's not, if this withdrawals are not as bad, then you count yourself lucky. She currently was having seven to eight hours of sleep of uninterrupted sleep. She was occasionally, her symptoms, all the symptoms were occasionally in the evening, maybe on plane rides or at the movies or late evenings, but essentially with the uh, getting her off the medication, the iron treatment, she had not formally returned to any particular medications. Basically, approximately every 12 to 18 months, her symptoms would act up. She'd let me know. I'd check her iron. And as for her case, her iron would always be low. I'd give her another IV iron infusion and her symptoms would be good for another essentially maybe a year to a year and a half. So the third case, basically a 67 year old gentleman um, uh, started when he was 62, so late onset, evening symptoms prior to starting treatment. So like eight and nine, eight, eight o'clock or so in the evening when he was trying to watch TV. I was on treatment for about four years, combination of the Rapinerol and Clonazepam. Um, when I saw him, he was on five milligrams of the Rapinerol and one milligram of the clonazepam. Um, his symptoms are occurring earlier in the day at 1 p.m. involving just the legs. Um, his total sleep time was about six hours per night. Uh, even though he wasn't complaining of insomnia, it, it, he just felt it was light sleep, it wasn't quality sleep. Uh, and he definitely felt sedated in the morning, probably related to the, the clonazepam. So this was a difficult case, um, primarily because of the clonazepam. You can't just withdraw it rapidly. There's potential for rebound anxiety. So I had to spend a lot of time just slowly tapering them off the clonazepam first. Um, and so the tapering period took almost eight weeks, so two months. Uh, so I started with the clonazepam first. And once I got that down, I made the, uh, the appropriate adjustment in in the Rapinerol for the primary Paxil and did my usual taper. Um, uh, basically on day three, so the drug-free period, as I talked to you, those first four days are just absolutely crazy. And even though I told him he's not to use any sedative hypnotics, he took 0.5 milligrams of the clonazepam that he had. Uh, it actually made the RLS worse and he was sort of confused. He fell and broke his hip. Um, so I put him back on the Prami Paxil, 
He had to undergo surgery for the hip and rehabilitation, uh, which again took a while. Um, and then I slowly tapered them off at 0 0.125 um, milligrams every two weeks. And so, so my protocol, I'm adaptable. I, I, it, there's nothing written in stone here. You gotta, I have to manage it based upon each individual. And so he got through that slow taper, went through the drug-free period. And basically when I saw him back, he had some late evening symptoms. I put him on gabapentin and he's been on gabapentin now for years and years and years without problems. So, so this is a complicated case, but you can see there's a lot of nuances to the whole process. Uh, it's not always, I wish it were, but it's not always straightforward. Uh, sometimes things intervene and uh, I, I make adjustments accordingly to try to, to stabilize things and then, then proceed, proceed on in this case to, to make sure I achieve the endpoint, which I think uh, he was happy with. I know he's happy with actually. So this is a 62 year old woman. Um, Arla started when she was about 55. Initially late evening and bedtime symptoms on treatment for seven years. Originally on Rapinerol and then, then on Primipaxil. Her Primipaxil dose was one milligram at in the early afternoon, then two milligrams around seven. Um, just to put things in context, you saw some of the large doses, like 10 milligrams of Rapinerol, things like that. Um, the relation, the um, Primipaxil is six times more effective and uh, potent in RLS than Rapinerol. And so this patient's on three milligrams of Primipaxil, so that's equivalent to 18 milligrams of Rapinerol. Um, uh, so getting people off Primipaxil, even what looks like low doses is often very good, difficult because in truth, they, it's not really low. It's, it's still uh, a significant amount. So, um, so her symptoms started at 1 p.m. involved her legs. Arliss was a problem in the afternoon and in the evening. Um, she was, you know, getting about six hours of, of, of sleep a night. It was fair to good. It wasn't, wasn't great. It was all right. Um, she was not happy. And as, as most of my patients are, and I, I agree, no one walks to my office and likes to hear the fact that I need to get you off this drug. I mean, they don't. Uh, and, and for all the reasons for many of them have stopped it accidentally, don't want to go through it. Um, so she was not happy about the detox, but she, she agreed to go through it. And um, so I, I changed her over to the reticotine patch. Um, uh, again, as, as a, it, for primary packs of the reticotine, it's just an easier process than getting her straight off the primary paxil. Um, and I, I, I set her up with a particular design, you know, three milligrams, taper, taper, taper. Um, she got into the drug free. She got three days into the drug free period uh, and gave up and went back on one milligram of primary paxil. Uh, essentially, this is true to say all my failures are going to occur on day three or day four of the drug free period. I have no one, you know, getting to day five for reasons I don't understand. Maybe I, I don't understand, but it seems like day five, people seem to have a, a better appreciation that they were more, how dependent they are on this drug and how much it was governing their life, even though, even though it should have been apparent, but there's a certain clarity that occurs on day five that seems to embolden patients to continue the process because their sleep is just as bad on day five as it is on day three and day four. So, but anyway, so um, she, she did not want to come off the primary Paxil. So in that situation, I referred her back to a neurologist for further management of her oral symptoms. Though I always, always leave open the option for patients to return to see me if they wish to continue or consider coming off the medication. So I am not 100% successful. My success rate is a little over 90%. So one in 10 patients will not make it through this process, but nine out of 10 will, will make it through. This is a 47-year-old gentleman, or less since he was 18 years of age, initially mild, late evening, bedtime symptoms. He was on dopamine agonist for 15 years, augmented, and then they did a direct conversion. So he was severely augmented. They started him on oxycodone extended release, 
just one for the other. They stop the medication, they get them off the medication, just put as much of the oxycodone on board that would be sufficient to take care of their other symptoms. And that had occurred about five years previously. When he saw me, he was on the oxycodone extended release, 40 milligrams, three times a day. The symptoms at that point were throughout the day, they were breaking through between doses uh, during sleep, uh, the question of augmentation. It sounds like augmentation. It's hard to say since he was already augment and you know he was already on three times a day. So there was already, we were, it was not like we were just treating nighttime symptoms and symptoms were popping up, but um, his total sleep time was four to six hours. It was fragment, it was poor. Um, his ferritin levels were in the normal, were in the high appropriate range and therefore he wasn't a candidate for uh, iron treatment there was significant daytime sedation related to the high doses of the oxycodone. So um, this is the point I wanted to bring up about substitutions. I said, some of my colleagues will not have you go through a, a dopamine withdrawal. They will put on a new medication, non-dopamine agent, and the opiates are the commonest ones. Uh, and methadone is the common to use one. Um, so I converted them over to a methadone, 10 milligrams, three times a day. So the conversion, the conversion for, ox, for methadone, to, for chronic pain, method, five milligrams of methadone is equal to five milligrams of oxycodone. For restless leg syndrome, five milligrams of methadone is equal to 20 milligrams of oxycodone. Again, indicating that restless legs and opiates in restless legs are not doing the same thing as they are for, for analgesia or for brain band. They're, they're different pathways and for, for uh, they're di different pathways. So I made the appropriate reduction, 2.5 milligrams every five days. So a slow reduction in the methadone. So I didn't put the methadone for the purposes of, of covering, but I really put it on as a, a better way to get them off and go through it. So he actually went through, the 12 night drug-free detox period as should have happened with the dopamine agonist. He had classic dopamine agonist withdrawal symptoms, or less all over the place, so, you know, up, up, no sleep for three nights, blah, blah, blah. He did not have the classic opioid withdrawal, the um, diaphoretic, tachycardia, GI symptoms, diarrhea. He did not have any of that. He just had what should have happened way back when, and thus indicating the process by which the dopamine agonists alter your brain dopamine levels can be shifted from one drug to another drug. And if you don't go through that with parole process, you're only hiding the eventuality of the problem, which is that augmentation will continue to grow and grow and grow once it gets started. And even drugs like methadone are not going to stop that process. The opiates and the altitude delta agents like gabapentin are not known to cause augmentation. If you see augmentation in these drugs, it's because someone converted them from an agonist to an opioid. And so on um, day 55 to 72, which is again 12, he, he went through the drug-free period. He had side effects with the methadone, even at the low doses. Um, so I started him back on the oxycodone extended release, but instead of 120 milligrams, he was on 10 milligrams in the early evening and then 20 milligrams at bedtime. And has remained on that dose with a highly effective treatment for over 10 years. Again, indicating that in this scenario, once you reverted the dopamine system back to something close to the baseline, then the opiates are going to work unhindered and unlikely to be have issues of augmentation or tolerance. Detoxic detoxification. Every patient will tell you it is absolutely the worst experience that they ever, ever have. But they will also tell you they are very, very happy to be off this drug because I think they all come to understand how physically and mentally dependent they become on it. Reinstitution of the dopamine agents no matter how long you've been off of it, will rapidly lead to augmentation again. I, you know, I, I, you know, I, sometimes I get desperate. Sometimes the patients, I don't know what else to do. And so after 10 years, I will 
reintroduce a bit of the agonist, whatever, in hopes that that augmentation, but it doesn't make a difference. It, it's it's going to happen. And, and should we be surprised? No. I mean, you're stimulating the dopamine pathway, which is the primary pathway involved in addiction, whether you're addicted to alcohol, tobacco, cocaine, or, or opiates. The dopamine system is, is the reinforcing property for addiction. And as is true for people who go off alcohol or go off tobacco, you can wait 10 years, you start smoking again, you can be back right there again. And that's true with the doping agonists. The other two classes of treatment, which are the afternoon delta agents, which include gabapentin, Lyrica, and Horizon, or the opiates, do not show augmentation. The only exception is tramadol. And that, that I, there's pharmacological reasons why that may be true. Um, but the other ones other, otherwise are not going to show augmentation. They do not have the severe rebound of symptoms that are often seen with the initial drug-free peer. So when the medications are stopped, if you're doing the alpha-2 delta, alpha deltas or the opiates, if you forget, you know, patients Friday night go to take the medication, the bottle's empty, and suddenly they, they go drug-free for, uh, for a weekend. So it, it happens. Uh, and though the symptoms will definitely go back to nothing to something, uh, you don't get the same intensity of rebound um, that you will experience when you actually come off the dopamine agonists. So I know this sounds, uh, this is where people are, I, I think, and you know, it's, this is what they're thinking when I even talk about it in clinic. And this is what they, this is where they're at, feeling very dark, very desperate, I, on you know day three, day four of, of the drug-free period. Um, but the vast, vast, vast majority of people will tell you this is where they feel. There's hope, there's a, re a significant relief of what they've been suffering with the augmentation. Uh, and therefore the vast majority of people are happy to have gone through this unfortunate experience to get to this relatively more hopeful state. So, Senator Varlas at, at Hopkins, um, your support, it's your research, your benefits for your disease. Um, we're happy here doing the research that hopefully one day will provide more insight and better treatments for RLS. Thank you all for, for um, being on this uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Early. We do have two questions. I know we're a little bit over time. Do you have some time to answer? Oh, uh, all the time in the world. Oh, great. Okay, so the first question, what is the target iron slash ferritin level for people with RLS? My doctor simply looks at the level for most people <laughs> and says it's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I understand. Okay. So the consensus guideline that we published, I want to say 2018, um, more or less came to the scenario that if, you're, if your ferritin is less than 100, micrograms per liter, that's 100, and your percent saturation is less than 45%, then everyone should receive an IV iron infusion. Um, we go with IV iron infusion primarily because oral iron, when your ferritin levels are in that low to low to mid range, are, you're not likely to absorb much in the way of iron. I mean, if you come in, frankly, iron deficient, oral iron, that's fine, you'll absorb a lot. But once your ferritin gets to about 50, or 75, which is just inside the quote normal range, um, you're really not going to absorb in much in the way of iron. And so the consensus is that um, any, a ferritin less than 100% saturation, less than 45%, um, uh, all, our, all, our, all patients with all us should receive uh, an IV iron infusion. Okay, great. And then the last question we have so far is there clinical evidence for the statement? Medications that attenuate the withdrawal symptoms prevent the biological reversal of the augmented state. Well, I guess I my case number five, I think, is what um, I, I provide as, as evidence. So a number of years ago, and I want to say about 20 years ago, I used to use methadone, as some of my colleagues have in the past or still do a low dose of methadone, which will almost completely prevent the withdrawal symptoms. Um, and so I was doing that on a fairly regular basis, thinking I was achieving something. And one of my patients 
who I'd done that to. She was on like on like 2.5 milligrams of methadone. It had only been on it for four weeks. Her family got all over about methadone and how bad it was and blah, blah, blah. So she stopped it. And of course, she went through horrendous withdrawal symptoms, as she should have done when I was getting her off the Ripinol, not the opiate withdrawal, the RLS, horrible RLS withdrawal. And she basically told my licensing, Maryland licensing uh, practice that I got her addicted. So I got notice and spent several years in legal processing of this. So I warn my colleagues that they are really going, they're really looking for problems because I think that that is in truth, all we're doing is moving a, a unfortunate altered dopaminergic system from one drug to another. And, you know, withdrawing like that from an opiate, they're going to blame the physician for making them addicted, even though the problem started with the dopamine agonist. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Oh, I think we might have one more question. Oh, we have one more question. After weaning off Pramipaxel and still need a medication for RLS, what do you recommend? Well, the, again, the other two, you have the other two categories, either the alpha-2 delta agents or opiates. If they haven't tried the alpha-2 delta agents, I always go with, with one of the alpha-2 delta, delta agents. Um, in the scenario where the patient said, well, I was on Repinerol, and then my doctors, you know, they started breaking through, and then my doctors tried me on the gabapentin. It sort of worked, but didn't work. Um, I think that that's not a fair trial, the gabapentin, because again, both opioids and the gabapentin are working upstream to modify the dopamine system. And so long as you're on a doping agonist, that drug has a stronghold. It, it basically controls your dopamine. There's no signal that's gonna be terribly effective to modify that signal. And so once they come off of the doping agonist, gone through the drug-free period, if they've not tried the alpha-2 delta agent like gabapentin or Lyrica as a monotherapy, independent of the dopamine agents, I will put them on the gabapentin first. If the gabapentin does not work, if there's intolerance to it, et cetera, et cetera, then I go to the opiates. Okay, great. Well, thank you again so much for your time, Dr. Early, and I will pass it along to Jamie with some closing thoughts. Yes, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and your talent. And we'd also like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. A follow-up email will be shared along with the recording of the program and a list of resources and our event schedules. So with that, I will bid you a happy holiday season and a happy, healthy new year. And I hope we see you again soon, Dr. Early. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And I thank you all who, who've uh, been here for the presentation. Take care.